everybody and welcome to tonight's webinar. We are on webinar 54 um, and we are looking at theory is the food of social work. So um, while you welcome into the room, let's have a look um, in the chat. I think Dave has just sent a message and Chris has sent a message. Fantastic. Uncle Juma. So um, I'm going to be looking at the chat a little bit later. But what I would like to know tonight is where in the world you are. I generally ask you this, but where are you in the world? What area of social work are you um, involved in? Um, are you a student? Are you a practice educator? Are you a social worker? Tell us a little bit about yourself and just to kind of go right back to the beginning, what have you had for your tea? Um, obviously tonight we are looking at a food analogy, so we want to know what have you had for your tea or if you haven't had your tea yet, what will you have? Or we realise that we do have lots of people from different countries, maybe it's not even tea time yet. Um, we don't want to assume that just because it's the time it is in the UK, everybody else sticks by that because we know you don't so what would you have for your tea if it was tea time thanks kelly um i love the fact that i think carly jane has put into the chat that she's a student social worker first day on campus today how how much fun is that so um i'm hoping everybody's had a good day i've seen on twitter quite a few people saying it was their first day on campus today so really exciting times isn't it um, so thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we will read with um, interest what you've had for your tea. You know, Kelly's always asked what you have for your tea for ages, hasn't you, Kelly? All the way through from the start. Um, and whenever I'm on a diet, I never want to know what people are having for the tea because it always makes me feel really guilty. And at the moment, I'm on a diet. Whenever I'm on a diet, I become completely obsessed by food. And that's why tonight our analogy is all about theory as the food of social work practice but we're just going to go right back to basics tonight and have a little bit of fun with theory and sometimes it's important to have fun with theory because as our very first webinar looked at the fear factor of theory sometimes people get worried about theory and sometimes a little bit frightened of theory and, and just breaking it down and having a bit of fun with it can um, help so we're going to have a bit of fun with theory tonight we're going to think of theory as the food of social work practice and it comes, I suppose, the inspiration, if that isn't too fancy a word for what we're doing tonight, but the inspiration for tonight's session comes from a quote from Lopez, who I think is um, an academic in social, well, is, he is an academic in sociology, but I think it's in Italy. And Lopez says, theory is typically taught in a way which presents theories as though they were recipes for practice. And he says, students often eat but they never get the chance to cook. And I think that's actually a really interesting quotation because it makes sense in sociology that students don't get the chance to cook with the recipes. They just kind of eat. They're just there as passive recipients. But for us as social workers, we do cook. We have to cook with the recipes. When you go on placement, you have to cook with the theory you've got to cook things up, you know, so you are testing out the recipes in practice. So I thought because of that quote, let's just delve a bit into our theories, really the recipes that we use for our practice and how else might food and theory be connected together. So I thought that we would use that. But while I was kind of doing a little bit of research around it and just thinking, you know, maybe looking for some photos, taking just some ideas from the Internet, I came across this and I think it's a beautiful quote. A recipe has no soul. You, as the cook, must bring the soul to the recipe. And I think if we think about theory in that way as a recipe, that is just a brilliant way of looking at it, isn't it? Because really, a theory in itself has no soul. We, as the social workers, bring the soul to the knowledge base that we use, to everything that you've been taught at university, you are the cook. You bring the soul into what you're doing as a social worker. So that's why we thought we'd be looking at theory as the food of social work. Now, one of my favourite writers, who is absolutely nothing to do with social work, but Temple Grandin. She is a woman with autism. She is um, an animal behaviourist scientist, I think, in America. And she says that people think 
in three different ways, three main ways that people think. And we're going to put a poll up. Well, Chris is going to pop a poll on the screen now to see what kind of thinker you are. So Temple Grandin says that you either can be a verbal thinker, which very much means you think in words, entirely in words. You can be a visual thinker, which means that you think in imagery and pictures and, you know, visual thinkers like flowcharts and diagrams. And if you just think about the notes, if you were on campus for the first time today, think about the notes you took. Were they just full of words or did you do a bit of doodling and a bit of spider diagramming and, you know, draw some little pictures next to it? You can also be a mathematical or musical thinker. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you're brilliant at maths or that you can play an instrument. Mathematical or musical thinkers, it's a less common type of thinking, but mathematical musical thinkers tend to think very logically and they have patterns in the way they think and the way in which they see things. So that's your mathematical musical thinker. So we're asking you on the screen whether you are a verbal thinker, a visual thinker, a mathematical thinker, or you're not sure. And um, it's, it's helpful, actually, for you to recognise what kind of thinker you are, particularly in relation to theory, because theory is very often expressed in very verbal ways. You know, think about it. You read it in the book. It's all very full of words. And yet when there's an image that goes with the theory, often it helps us to understand it much more clearly. So think about something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Everybody remembers that one. And as soon as I say it, I bet in your head you've got the image of the triangle, you know, and you can see that image. Because when we see something visually, it often really helps us to understand it. Now, there's a bit of research around verbal visual thinking and um, the research says, I think it's, um, I think it's Amit et al, but I, I, we could look at the research. I can send you the, re we'll, we'll get Di and Kultuma to send you the research um, reference in the follow-up email. But there's research that says around about 60% of people are visual thinkers. So there's research saying that more of us are visual than verbal. And actually that's come through on the poll look. If you look at the poll, 32% of you are verbal, 47% are visual, 8% of you are mathematical, musical, and some of you are not sure, which is okay. But we tend to be more visual thinkers. And just based on my experience of working with social workers and students, I tend to see that actually we are more picture-based thinkers and yet there's a problem with that because in social work the phrase that's used is if it's not written down it didn't happen you can't draw a picture and take that in as your assessment can you I mean it's very verbal that the tasks that we have to do are very much about what we write down and yet lots of us are very visual so tonight I suppose we'll use a lot of visual imagery tonight is going to be full of analogies and analogies work particularly well for verbal for sorry for visual thinkers for thinkers who think in imagery it'll still work for those of you who are verbal but hopefully you'll get quite a bit out of tonight if you are a visual thinker who maybe struggles with some of the reading around theory so let's go straight into thinking about food as our analogy for theory. We're going to start to think about the difference between a theory, a model, a method and an approach in social work. Now I know we've done this previously in our Back to Basics webinars on theory but I still think this is worth revisiting. You know Kelly said earlier when we were just getting things ready oh, I'll just tell it me again because I like hearing it over and over and Kelly's heard it even before the webinars ever started because I did a session that you were at Kelly even before the pandemic so actually this is something that is worth revisiting and just refreshing yourself on. I think it is really important to just understand this difference now if you feel if you're new to this and you've not been to the other webinars you think oh I'd really like a bit more on that there is a YouTube video on the difference between a theory and model and method and approach on my YouTube channel it's one of the very first ones that I did it's had loads of views I think it's probably the most popular video on the channel but I'm going to go through it really quickly with you and we're going to use a food analogy to think about that so 
when you're at university, you tend to be taught all of it together. Everything is kind of merged together. But it's helpful if you can separate out what is a theory, what is a model, what is a method, because then it's helpful for you to think about how you're going to use it. So a theory is all about our understanding. So there's some examples there. There's some uh, some of the theory cards that I've separated out into. There's the theories in the theory cards. Just some examples as well typed on the screen. So attachment theory is one that's used a lot in children's. Othering is a great theory around anti-oppressive practice that is worth you thinking about. Child development, human growth and development theory. You'll learn a lot about that during your social work training if you're a new student. Karpman's drama triangle is a fabulous one. There's quite a few of you here today, I think, who are practice educators and Karpman's drama triangle is great if you're a practice educator. So a whole range of theories, but essentially all a theory does is it helps guide our understanding. It's about how we understand what is going on in a situation. But then a model is what guides our intervention. So a theory helps us to understand, but it doesn't say here's now what to do about that situation. A model helps us to guide intervention as a social worker. So when we're working with an adult, a child, a family, what we do to intervene is based around a model. So we might use something like uh, motivational interviewing or the um, local authority that perhaps you're working in might use a model, specific model like the Hackney model or signs of safety or, you know, um, I don't know, the, the new family safeguarding model that's um, being used quite a lot now. So different organisations sometimes use different models. Three conversations model is quite widely used in adult services. So different models would be used in different organisations you might like a particular model you'll learn about a range of different models on your social work training but there's a whole range of models on the slide in front of you a model guides what you do it's all about your intervention and then we've got okay but what about a method because i thought a method was your intervention that's what i get asked well actually a method is the tool or the technique that you use in your practice. So your method is likely to have come out of a model. Sometimes as a practice educator, I go out and I observe a student in their practice and they do something that I think, oh, that was really interesting, that was really good. And in my feedback, I might say to them, I really liked that, that was great that you did there, where's that come from? And they'll say, oh, um, I saw somebody else do it or my friend told me about it or I got it off social work toolkit on Twitter or something. They don't really know where it's come from. As a student, you need to develop your understanding of where do the techniques that you're using come from. They will all come out of a model. So something like three houses. OK, three houses is a direct work tool. Nearly all of the direct work tools we use would be described as a method. But three houses, loads of people use it. You know, there's an app that they use and loads of people use three houses. But then if I say to them, OK, that's great. Where's it come from? They don't know where it comes from. It comes from signs of safety. Now, just because you've used three houses, it doesn't mean that you've used the whole of signs of safety. But you should know where the methods you use come from. So think about the method you're using, where it comes from. So something like strengths mapping is, the, you know, it's a common method used in adult services to think about the strengths that people have, for example, eco maps or genograms or even um, doing a, a, a chronology would be a particular method or technique that you're using. So a method is your tool or your technique. So the picture on the screen is the cookery utensils. It's all about your particular technique for cooking your recipe up. So then the final bit, and really, in a way, we should start with an approach. As a practitioner, we would start with an approach. But in my explanation, I'm going to conclude with an approach. And I'm going to conclude with the approach because it's a good way of putting it all back together. So an approach is your overall way of working. The overall way of going about something. 
some of the approaches are there taken from the theory cards. You've got a range of different approaches on the screen there. Now, the approach that you want to take might end up in conflict with the approach, the local authority, the, the organizational approach, or even the political approach of the time. So you might want to work in a way which is, I don't know, very relationship based. You know, you want to take a relationship based or relational approach. But perhaps the organisation that you're on placement with or that you work for says, actually, we don't have the time and the resources for you to spend very much time with that individual. So that impacts on your ability to be relationship based in your practice. So you need to think about the approach that you take. You as a, as a student, you'll be developing your approach, the way in which what kind of cook are you? You know, what kind of cook are you? That's your approach to practice. But actually, when you get out into practice, maybe you can't be that kind of cook. Maybe you have to cook in a slightly different way. And it will become clear as we go through the analogy this evening why you've got to cook in a slightly different way. But your approach is your overall way of going about something. Now, your approach connects back to everything else. So the approach you take is going to influence the theories that you use. So the kind of cook you are is going to it's going to influence the recipes that you want to use. It's going to influence the techniques you use in your cooking. And, you know, it's going to influence everything about the way in which you work. So your approach as a social worker influences everything else. It flavors what you do. And so to stick with the food analogy, what I'm going to ask you to do, although it sounds very strange, is I'm going to ask you to imagine a model in social work as if it was a curry. OK, so a model is a curry. Now, I grew up um, near Curry Mile in Manchester. I knew lots about different kinds of curries on Curry Mile. But then I moved to near where, where I live now, which is near to Birmingham. And here it's full of Balti curries. I'd never heard of a Balti before, even though I'd grown up on Curry Mile. But here it's the Balti is the kind of curry. You could have a Jamaican jerk curry. You could go, couldn't you, to a Thai restaurant and they do like a whole rainbow of curries, don't they? They have red, yellow, green. You've got the whole range. You could have a Japanese katsu curry if I'm honest with you particularly when I'm trying to diet my favorite kind of curry is that kind of curry you know the stuff you pour on your chips from the chippy it's really gloopy I love that kind of curry sauce you could also go to McDonald's and have a dip in curry sauce couldn't you, you could have just the, the curry sauce that you just dip your chips into all of that all of the pictures you can see on the screen now they're all curry but they're all completely different. And that's because the approach that you've taken is either a Balti approach or a fast food approach or a Japanese katsu approach or the fish and chip shop approach. So very often when you're a student social worker, you see a model and you think, oh, I know that. I understand the model. But then you watch two social workers use the model and they use it in a completely different way. And you think, hang on a minute, I, 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 I thought they were using this model, but it's because they flavored it up differently. One of them has flavored the curry using the Japanese technique. And another one has used, it, has used the sweet curry from McDonald's technique. So your approach flavors your model and the way in which you do things. It completely flavors everything. And just to really try to reinforce that, this is a picture I found off the internet to show, OK, what about if you take a child centred approach to your curry? That's what it would come out looking like. So the approach that you take flavours everything else that you do as a social worker. So that's the start of our food analogy, but it goes a lot further than that. You can really dig into the food. Can you tell that I'm on a diet and it makes me desperate to look at food and see food? And look, I just went for the pick and mix. It's my favorite kind of sweets as well, pick and mix. I do love a good pick and mix. But very often people talk about pick and mix in theory. Oh, I have a bit of a pick and mix of theory. You know, when you've been a very a qualified social worker for a long time, 
you'll hear people talking about, oh, I take an eclectic approach. Pick and mix. I have a bit of this and a bit of that. They don't necessarily all go together, but they look lovely when you put them all in a bowl together. You know, it's that kind of pick and mix. It's people think that they're using a variety of different sweets, and that is what they would describe as their eclectic approach. So there's your pick and mix. Another analogy around food we explored when we did the, I think it was webinar 17, we looked at a theory picnic and we touched on theory and food in the picnic. We particularly looked at the sandwich of theory and this is the sandwich if you remember it from webinar 17 where we looked at social work theory is kind of sandwiched in between psychology and sociology. So we draw quite a lot of theory from psychology. That's all the theory about understanding the individual that we're working with, maybe what makes them tick and what's going on for, you know, human growth and development and thinking about behaviour and all of that, thinking about how people react together, all comes out of psychology. But then we draw a lot from sociology. So really the sociology theories that we draw on are the ones where they're about our understanding of society. So, you know, sociological theories that we understand are about how society and community operates, for example. So it makes complete sense that we draw on both psychology and sociology in social work, because the thing that social workers do is we take an individual in environment perspective. The theories about individuals tend to come from psychology. The theories about environments tend to come from sociology. So we're going to draw on a bit of everything in our sandwich. Now, it links back to your approach. Some people have a bit of an open sandwich without a top on it. Some people just like a sociological approach. You know, they're very much focused on society and changing society. And other people are very much more individualistic and looking at just the individual. So they've just got the psychology bit. But a really good sandwich has a bit of everything. So we've got a bit of psychology going on there, a bit of social work and a bit of sociology. And you also throw in a packet of crisps, which we'll look at later. But, you know, a good sandwich has a bit of everything for us in terms of social work theory. So I'm going to ask you now, back to the food analogy, I want to ask you, what's your favourite kind of food? Because really, in a way, your favourite kind of food is like, what's your approach to social work, isn't it? Do you like to take the Chinese approach to, the, to your curry or do you like to take an Indian or a Thai approach to your curry? It's the kind of food that you like to eat is almost like your favorite theories, your favorite models, your favorite approaches. Chatting this through with the team, Kulchuma talked about when we get a staple diet, so I pinched the idea off her into this bit of the presentation and what I was thinking, because I think Kulchuma, you said, you know, a staple diet like attachment is one of the staple theories. It's one of the go to theories. And I thought, you know, that's a really actually a really good use of the analogy to think about those staple theories. So some theories we definitely refer to more than others. They're almost like the staple theories, as Kulchuma was saying in our WhatsApp group, because we kind of WhatsApp when we're preparing these sessions. But then I was thinking, sometimes staple food, it's a bit stodgy, isn't it? You know, if you eat too much carbs, it kind of leaves you a bit full. It's a bit stodgy. Maybe we shouldn't just be using those theories because those theories, perhaps we're only using those because they're the only ones we understand. I think sometimes when I ask students in supervision on placement, what theory are you using there? After they look like the terrified rabbit in the headlights and then they kind of get a little bit more comfortable with it, it's nearly always the same four or five theories over and over and over again. It's that that's their staple, their go to. And I think sometimes it's just because, OK, I understand these. I got these at university so I can think about how to link them. Where actually what we need to do is think about a range of different, you know, food. Thinking about. You know, the staple diet in different countries is different, isn't it? They might use the same ingredients or cook it differently, but it's different, I suppose, in different countries. And that's really like the way the theories that we use, we need to change them depending on the context that we're in, the way that we're practicing. We need to change them. So we shouldn't always stick to the same staple diet. 
you'll still have some favorite food and that's okay to have some favorite food but nobody wants to eat exactly the same meal every day you want a bit of variety in your life everybody wants a bit of variety in their life but there might be some food that you really don't like there might be some theories that you absolutely don't like so to try and illustrate that, I'm going to give you a little bit of a story. It's about food poisoning. I didn't really get food poisoning. It's a kind of analogy for what happened. I One of my very first jobs, and I think it was actually when I referred to the joy of social work, when we talked about our joys last week, I think I talked about supporting someone who'd lived in an old long stay hospital more than 50 years move into the community. It was at the early stage of my career and I was... Um, Back in the day, in the early 1990s, was when we were bringing in um, care in the community. So we were closing down the big old hospitals. And um, so I'm fairly newly qualified. And I was attached. Every one of the social workers was given particular wards to work on that we were going to move people out of to live in the community. And the wards that I was attached to, I was told, oh, it's a very specialist ward. It needs a lot of specialist work. It's the specialist behaviourist ward. Um, and I was told, you know, all the staff on there, they've had loads of training on behaviorism and it's very highly specialized. All I can say to you is it's the most oppressive place I've ever been in, even to this day. You know, 32 years later, I can't remember going anywhere as oppressive as that environment. I went onto that ward to meet some of the people that I was going to be working with. And I learned very quickly that. You had to behave in certain ways on this ward to earn a cigarette because they had this behavior. It's like a checklist of things you had to do in order to get a cigarette. There were other kinds of behaviors that you had to demonstrate in order to get a light. I mean, it was, I imagine it was impossible to get a cigarette and a light at the same time. You probably couldn't actually smoke anyway. And yet all of the staff sat around a big, big round table in the middle of the room smoking all through the day. And I was incensed by this experience and working with the people that I was working with, I couldn't wait to get them out of this terrible, terrible environment. And so I thought that's it, I behaviorism, it's terrible. I really don't like behaviorism. But of course it was just very badly cooked behaviorism, you know? But to this day, I don't like behaviorism as an approach. I don't want to use it. And it's because I've been left with a bad taste in my mouth, haven't I? It's been, it's my example of food poisoning. So there's always going to be some theories you like and some you don't like. And there might be a story behind why you don't like some theories. And that's okay. But make sure there's a bit of variety in your diet. You know, make sure there's a range of different theories that you're going to draw on. So the kind of food that you eat and you like can be influenced by a whole range of things. You know, I don't know what, what kind of um, food you like to eat, but some people might, you might follow a vegan diet because of ethical reasons. You might have an allergy or a specific condition that means you have to be gluten free or you're lactose intolerant or, you know, it could be a whole range of things. For me, it's all about, I have to eat a particular way because I'm wanting to lose a bit of weight, you know, so there can be a whole range of reasons. It might just be about how much money you've got and what you can afford to eat. It might be the ingredients that you can get hold of at the food bank or at the supermarket, or it might just be what you're able to get hold of. It might be about if you're eating with somebody else. You know, I know if I was eating on my own, I don't bother cooking so much as if I'm eating with somebody else. Or if I've got some friend, I've got one friend who's a really fussy eater and I've got to cook in a particular way if she's coming, for example. It might just be your mood, you know, oh, I really feel like some comfort food. You know, that phrase is used, comfort food, because it does comfort us. It might be about how much time you've got to cook something. It might be about how skilled you are as a cook. I'm not a great cook. Some of this team are amazing as cooks. You want to see the photos of the food that they cook, that they put in. Kulchuma on Eid, I mean, it's amazing the stuff that she puts into the WhatsApp chat. You know, some of the cooking skills in this group are amazing. I'm a very limited cook. So it could be about the skills that you've got. A whole range of things are going to influence the kind of food that you eat. In the same way, a whole range of things are going to influence the theories that you use. And it's similar things that are actually going to influence the theories you use. The ethics that you hold and the values that you hold 
might lead you to using certain theories and models because you feel that they're more ethical. It might be that you want to change the way that you look to a service user by using a particular model. It might be that you're going to choose a particular model because of the family you're working with and you know that they've got a particular need or circumstance or you've not got very much time so you're going to use this particular approach to work with this individual. The same kinds of things influence the food we eat and the theories and models that we use in our practice. The same as our relationship with food. You know, in many ways, our relationship with food, and each of us has a different relationship with food, mirrors our relationship with theory. So our relationship with food might be influenced by our early life experiences. If there was never any food available for you at home, then you're going to want to kind of, you know, eat everything that's available to you at once. We all know that. We've seen that in terms of, you know, when people, uh, uh, when we think about trauma, the impact that trauma can have on your relationship with food. Our emotions impact our relationship with food, how we feel about ourselves impacts our relationship with food. And we all need you know, different things at different stages in our lives. And all of that also influences our relationship with social work theory. It's also the link between food, identity and culture. That also relates into our understanding of theory. One of the things that has underpinned all of the webinars that we do, and we come back to saying, time and time and time again is we've got to challenge where the theory base comes from. It all comes from a very Eurocentric, very white European kind of background where actually we ought to be drawing on other theories and approaches. Remember how helpful we found Ubuntu for social work for World Social Work Day. Well, that comes from an, America, uh, from a, from an African um, context Think about some of the theories that we might find really helpful that come from an American context. You know, think about the wide range of different approaches used all over the world. I think social pedagogy is amazing, fabulous. And yet we don't hear much talk about social pedagogy in this country. If you went to Scandinavia or Germanic Europe, it would be huge. So think about, let's challenge some of this. Let's question some of it. Let's make it more culturally appropriate for the people that we're working with, the theory that we use. Let's not try and apply all of this Eurocentric theory. Let's think about, is the theory base that we're using culturally appropriate for the people that we're supporting? Even down to language, you know, Kelly at the start said to you, what if you had for your tea? Now I call it tea because I'm a northerner. Some people, I mean, I mean, it can cause a right argument in the group, whether it's, I mean, I can see Chris raising her eyebrows here. You know, it's supper. I think for Chris, or it's dinner. Is it dinner for you, Chris? Chris, dinner for Chris. I think maybe Kat calls it supper. I can't remember, but we all call it different things. It's the same meal, just what we call it. You know, I don't know whether you call something a bread roll, a balm cake, a, a bap. I mean, it gets called all kinds of different things. Theory, we call theories all kinds of different things all over. You know, just let's think about the impact and the link really here between theory and culture and identity and all of that how we do it you know theories that we use other professionals use and they call it something different to what we call it and that's just about our professional identity culture and theory it all connects it all links together and it will influence your favorite kind of food. What kind of food do you like to eat? Your culture will influence the kind of food you like to eat, the kind of theory you like to use. And this takes me back to it. I, I, I think it was fascinating. If you've been on Twitter for a long time in the social work Twitter world, you will remember there was the great social work crisp debate amongst social work academics. It really made me giggle. There was a group of social work academics that had this whole thing about which was the best packet of crisps. They had a whole thing about it and which crisps they should have. And I don't know, I, I love potato crisps in, in Ireland, you know, and there's all these different debates about the different crisps that the social work academics liked. I remember giggling about it quite a lot. You might come across it. If somebody tweets it on Twitter tonight, honestly, you'll get all of the academics fighting over it again. It was really funny. 
And it turned then from the great social work crisp debate turned into the social work biscuit debate and what was the favourite kind of biscuits. And that just reminds me of academics' favourite theories. You're all at different universities. What you learn at one university to what you learn at a different university will sometimes just be about what your lecturer's favourite packet of crisps is. What's your lecturer's favourite theory? That's what they're going to teach you. What's your lecturer's favourite packet of biscuits? That's what they're going to teach you. Because the thing about theory is, it is about what we like. Because theory is really about what we think. No one can tell you what to think. So it is about a personal choice. Models may be less so, because models are about how you intervene and what you do. And sometimes that is more influenced by the environment you're in. But all of this is about your choice. What theories do you like and why do you like them? And really, in using all of this stuff, what I'm trying to do is break down for you the fear factor that surrounds theory. I'm trying to bring a bit of fun to theory and make it less frightening and less scary because it does frighten people and it shouldn't frighten people. But I want to, this part for me, this slide is really important in terms of this food analogy and how social work is the food, theory is the food of social work. If we think about the recipes that we started off with and the recipe book, you start learning to cook, you have to follow the recipe book, don't you? I remember whatever I was learning to cook, I had to follow the recipe book. Exactly. I had to weigh everything and measure everything. And then, I'd, you know, I remember sometimes phoning my mum up going, how do you make such and such thing? And it used to really irritate me because my mum would go, oh, a cup full of that, handful of this. And I'd be like, a cup full? I've got like six different cups here. What's a cup full? They're all different sizes. So when you've been cooking a while, you're not quite as exact anymore as you were when you first started. So I, when I first started to learn to cook, I had to follow everything exactly as it was. If I didn't have an ingredient, I'd panic. I think I can't cook that because I haven't got that ingredient. And it's a bit like that when you start in social work. You feel like you've got to do everything exactly. But when you've been a social worker for a long time, you're just cooking. You don't look at the recipe anymore. You just cook. You change the recipe up a little bit. You think, oh, I'm going to add a bit more of that because I like that. Or, you know, oh, I don't like that ingredient. So I'll swap it up for something else. That's what you do. Now, a cookery book gives you the formal theory. It gives you, here is Delia Smith's way of cooking this. You can tell how out of date I am, can't you? Or here is, I don't know who else is, the Jamie Oliver's way of doing this or Heston Blumenthal's way of doing it. It gives you somebody else's idea, the formal idea. When you've been cooking for a while, you often don't look at the recipes. You do what we might call informal theory or practice wisdom You've been cooking for ages, so you just get on and kind of cook and do it. Let's say one of you invited me to your house for tea and you made me your signature dish, whatever your signature dish is. Let's say it's a lasagna. You made me lasagna for my tea and I went, oh, it's lovely. Can I have the recipe? And you'd say, oh, it's just my own recipe. Well, it probably isn't. You probably started off cooking Delia Smith's recipe for lasagna or something. But over the years, you've changed it a bit. But every now and again, you've got to go back to the recipe, because if you don't go back to the recipe one night, it's going to turn out completely wrong and you won't be really sure why it turned out wrong. So we have to go back to the recipe books. And really, your theory books are your recipe books that we go back to every now and again that we revisit. But you don't have to do it exactly. You don't have to weigh it and measure it exactly the way you've been told. You might mix up the ingredients a little bit over time and turn the recipe into your own recipe. That's what makes practice wisdom. And that's how we learn to cook. There's quite a few of you who come to our sessions who are apprentices or who may be like Chris, go and do the degree after actually you've been working in the field for a long time. I think this analogy helps us to understand. Let's imagine you've got two different types of student. You've got a student who's come into social work like I did straight from school, very limited experience. I was clutching the cookery book because I had to learn how to cook. 
you've got somebody else who's an apprentice who's been working in the job a long time or like Chris has been doing the job a long time before doing the degree you've been cooking for ages and then somebody's trying to tell you how to go back to the recipe book and you're like it doesn't work like that you can't cook it like that because you've been doing it a while but what you've got to be able to prove is you can still cook with the original recipes. So it can really just help us to think about our different ways of learning about those recipes, about the theories, the knowledge that we're using at university. Think about it. Think about it did come from somewhere. Those of you who've been social workers for years, you practice educators, you've forgotten the recipes you were using, but you are still cooking to some kind of recipe. More on the link between theory and particularly when you're thinking about reading your cookery books sometimes have you ever been to one of those kinds of restaurants I've not been here clearly it's just a picture I have never been to this kind of restaurant but you know where you feel completely excluded by the menu you know I, I've been places and it goes it's I don't know something something with walnut air and raspberry jus and you're like what's that well it's just gravy why don't they call it gravy why don't they call crushed peas with a mint air? Why don't they call it just mushy peas? But they don't, do they? They have to call it something fancy. And that's a bit like theory. They have to put big words to it. But really, it is just mushy peas. All you got to do is find your way through the big words. Find a cookery book or a recipe book that explains it in a way that you understand, in a clear way. What we don't want is recipes that only the foodies can understand. You need to find ways where you can understand it. I did a theory session yesterday, actually, for, so I changed this slide quickly, added it in, because I did a session yesterday for some very experienced social workers about theory. And I said to them, you know, how are you using theory? And one of them said this, and I thought, oh, I'm going to use that tomorrow because it links to my food analogy. But one of them said, to be honest, Siobhan, it's all just blended in together. You know, it's all just blended in. And it just made me think about blenders. And what I was thinking about, was trying to get into the, there's some quotes about why we should use theory and practice. And I was thinking, okay, theory without practice is like having a lid without a food processor. It is totally pointless. There's nothing you can do with it. It looks nice and shiny, but it's one of those things that sits in a drawer, you know, that you think, what was that for again? You don't, you can't remember what it was for. It's totally pointless. But then practice without theory is the opposite. It's like having the food processor without the lid. It's totally dangerous. You're going to get messy. So you've got to bring the two together in your cooking. But how do you bring it together? Which order do you do it in? It's a bit like your scone with your jam and cream. Which one comes first? And I don't want to cause a huge argument here because I know there's a difference between Cornwall and Devon and all of that. And I know some people like the cream first and some people, I like it like that with the jam and then the cream, but you can have it, you can eat it however you want to eat it. I'm not prescribing, but it's a bit like sometimes people say to me, well, what comes first, the theory or the practice? Should I choose the theory and then apply it to the practice or should I do the practice and then apply the theory? And if I'm honest, don't think it matters. As long as you're comfortable with it, doesn't matter as long as you bring the two together because a scone with jam with no cream is no good a scone with cream with no jam it's no good you have to have the two and put it together in any way you like whatever works for you put it together in any way you want but what we know in terms of theory and this fear factor and how everybody thinks I don't understand theory at all. I'm going to keep quiet that I don't understand it, but I don't understand it because you always think that everybody else understands it. A bit like you always think that everybody else's food tastes better than yours. Have you ever been out with like, I go out with my husband and he orders something. I think, oh, I wish I'd ordered what you've got. I much prefer it. And I end up eating half of it anyway. So that bit about we always prefer someone else's food to our own. We think everybody else understands theory, but I'm here to tell you tonight they don't. And the team are going to tell you some of their ways of thinking about theory and food to show you how we've all struggled with it in a way. Now, Di came up with this. Unfortunately, Di has been kept at work, like not not kept. You know, it's not like she's on detention or something. Um, made it sound like that, didn't it? But she's been delayed by a work issue. And so I said I would give. Dai's idea but Dai said a bit like an all-you-can-eat buffet really isn't it you go up you know when there's one of them all-you-can-eat restaurants you go up and you fill your plate 
too high with everything. I mean, Di didn't say this, it's going to be in my words, clearly. It was a brilliant idea of Di's. I would say your eyes are bigger than your belly because that's a very northern thing when you just want everything. You're filling it all up. But actually, that's sometimes what we do with theory, isn't it? We think we've got to use everything. I've just learned all of these things at university, so I've got to use all of them in this piece of work. I've got this whole plate full of stuff I've got to use. But actually, you really need to think about portion size and how much you're going to use and what works together as well. So when you write your essay, do not throw everything at it. I think the temptation sometimes is I'm going to write an essay. So I'll throw all the theory that I've learned in and end up with this pile of plate, you know, piled high. So I thought that was a lovely image of dyes, a brilliant analogy, because I've recognised that in myself. I try and throw a bit of everything in. Your eyes are bigger than your belly, I think. So that was Di's idea. Um, the team have all come up with their own ideas. So I'm going to pass on to Chris, who's going to tell you about her idea. And it's actually your own cookery here, isn't it, Chris, this photograph? It is. I'm getting really hungry now. I've got to tell you, all these pictures of food is driving me crazy. Um, yeah, so you can see I, I made some croissants. Um, my lovely husband bought me a course, a day's course to learn how to do this. And that was the result of it. And I'm pretty pleased with them I have to say and they tasted really good but it, it made me think about how you know social work and theory it's a bit like the layers that you get in a croissant and when you make croissants you spend a lot of time folding and rolling and layering creating layers with the dough and the butter to make them rise and make them all lovely and fluffy and it just made me think that social work is a lot like that and you know whether you've been in it for a very short period of time or a really long period of time, there are always other layers that you can dig down to and that you can understand things at. So I tend to, as Siobhan has said, stick to the same kind of few theories, but, but actually I kind of find I'm understanding them at different levels now. Um, and as my journey has progressed, so has my understanding and my use of them. So what I'd say is it's, it's a bit of a journey as is making croissants. <laughs> Fab, I love the idea of the layers, because I mean, I can't make a croissant. I, I think if I've bought one from Tesco and I put it in the oven, I think I've cooked it, you know, but um, then um, I've seen it on the Bake Off where they do all that folding over. And it's really food. hard. Yeah, and the layering. And actually layers and layers, like you say, I love the way you describe that, we use theory, but our understanding of it kind of goes deeper and the, the layers are going, you know, more in depth as we learn over time. So thank you for that, Chris. Now, um, Chris, that goes from Chris's cooking to, and here is Dave's cooking. So there's Dave's cooking for you. Yeah, Dave's cooking is very much single male student with no one to worry about how it looks cooking. Um, so a while back, um, the group had these deals from, I think it was HelloFresh, and they send you several meals and they explain it and they give you uh, the recipe. But my idea was, it's all going out of date, put it all in the pan and it'll work. And it was chicken and bacon and sausages and it sounds disgusting, but it was delicious. Um, so my, my concept um, that I wanted to talk about is um, taking the time to experiment with your um, with your theories. I've linked the I've linked the theory cards earlier several times, guys. Um, and I'm just like just for for a good example that I've pulled. Um, so we're talking about going to staple theories and the ones you learn in class a lot. And you'll all know Maslow. You'll all know person centered approach. You'll all know Ericsson's. Now, if you're working with someone, those could technically work together and help you come up with a good way of supporting uh, service users. I hate the word service user, but supporting them. However, if you add in another thing like um, outcomes focused approach, that may then um, complicate how you approach working with someone because it gives you outcomes, but then it may be less person centered approach, even though you're working with them. Um, so it may go against what they want in, in order to go around getting that. So you need, really need to sit and think about um, whether you've got the theory cards or not, you really need to sit and think about the theories that you know and how you would apply them to certain situations. Because you may feel very confident, like me, 
in person centered approach practices but then you go in and there's another there's a curveball like you go in and the people that are working with the person you're working with are very dehumanizing towards them uh, they've got a very uh, non strengths based approach and then you have to figure out what you're going to add to the person centered approach to make it a robust um way of supporting um and basically, yeah, that's it. So going from my chaotic sausage chicken kitchen to that, and the point is, if you don't, if you don't think it through and you don't experiment with the thought process and how you're going to apply the theories, you may end up going in and absolutely stressing yourself out and stressing someone else out because you've not thought of how you're going to apply the theories, basically. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. So... I think so, Dave. I like, I think formally in the world of cooking, if we, I think you and I are probably the least skilled cooks in the group, looking at the photos of things. I've never even put a photograph in of what I cook. So, but I remember everybody putting all the photos in of all these lovely things they'd done and then saying, Dave, have you got a photo? And you went, oh, I just chucked it all in. And <laughs> I just really liked the way you did that. But um, I think the formal, if we wanted to be very fancy, we could call it fusion cookery, yes. where we're fusing everything together, aren't we? And fusion cookery, some things go together very well and some, some things do. don't go together very well, do <laughs> they? And I think that's the bit that's really important is when we're working through things, what complements each other and what doesn't. Yep, so, that, was the, that yeah. was the point I was trying to get to. Thank you, Shiva. Yeah. Think fabulous. Think fusion cookery. It makes us sound like we're very skilled when we're not. So thank you for that, Dave. And then we're going to go on to um, Kelly's idea. Um, so Kelly, that's your slide. Brilliant, cheers Siobhan. Um, yeah, so I was thinking a little bit about um, kind of continuing on from what you were saying earlier about um, the way that you do something. Like you might see somebody use, might see two people use the same approach maybe or the same method or something, but they do it completely differently. And that could be up to them as a person or the person they're working with. Um, and for me, I would say that I think technique is really important, like the way that you do something is really important. So um, the way that you deliver something, um, if you look at something like assessment, you know, we could probably all agree that an assessment is, you know, gathering some information, however you do that. But the way that you do that might be really different to somebody else. And you might do two, you might gather information differently depending on um the person that you're working with and how they need you to gather that information um, and I think you know things like communication skills we we think they're really basic but they're they're absolutely fundamental in you explaining yourself and if if you can explain something really well you've got a really good chance of getting the person you're working with to understand where you're coming from um, and whether that's kind of delivering some news that a person really doesn't want to hear um, or if you're trying to explain a difficult concept I think you know the way that you do something is really important um, and I think when it comes to theories and approaches and things like that you need to understand the theory or approach or method that you're using you need to really understand it a bit like Chris said, that if if the way you're working with someone isn't working, what is a different way you could do that? And if you have a kind of one dimensional understanding of what you think is person centred or what you think is a narrative approach or what you think is a psychodynamic approach, then you may need to kind of flip that a little bit and still do the same thing, but deliver it slightly differently. If you want to know about someone's early history and that's part of the assessment and the chronology, you can't not get that information, but how do you ask those questions in a way that that person gives you the answers that you need and feels comfortable doing that um, and that they they kind of are part of that and it's not a really difficult process of, I don't want you to know this because you might think this or you might do that kind of the communication is open and I think that's why technique is really important it's not what you do it's the way that you do it and that like I say could differ according to the professional or the person that you're working with um, and I think that's really important to, to bear in mind so yeah that's what I always try to kind of keep in my head when I'm working with people. 
Thank you, Kelly. It reminds me of the Banana Rama song, doesn't it? It's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. There's another analogy we could do music. We'll do music next time. Food's fabulous, so so that you're right, it's absolutely it's not just what you do, it's the way that you do it. But I also think so when you said this in our WhatsApp group, made me think of this, and so I've got a nice picture to go with it. It's not just what you do not just the way you do it, but it's also how you present it, isn't it? So, you know, you can present your food on a plate beautifully and it looks beautiful. You know, when on MasterChef and stuff, I was laughing at those programs, but you know, they make it look and they go, oh, it speaks to your eyes as well. I'm like, I just eat it, me. You know, I'm, I'm not so fancy about this stuff, but definitely for students in terms of your assignments it's not what you do or even the way you do it that's being assessed it's how you present it it's how you write about it it's how you share what you have done with other people so how you present it also matters which is why there's a beautiful picture there of food presented in a very fancy way and then I think the final um, team member who is going to share something tonight is Kulchuma. And Kulchuma, you thought about this as your analogy, weaning. I did, yes. Yeah. So when uh, Siobhan asked the team for ideas on how they related food to theory, um, I went back to my children. So when they were babies and when I first started uh, my journey into education and looking at theories, um, where I didn't know anything about it at all. So I had to start right back at the basics and start with the smooth stuff, the easy to understand stuff, as you do when you're weaning a baby. So easy to di digest, easy to understand. Um, and then as I've progressed through my education, so from my access course to year one to year two, and now finally in my final year, um, I think I've sort of gone through the process of the weaning. So I've gone from like the easy to digest to the slightly lumpy and now to the solid food where I'm actually understanding the theory a little bit better. Um, and in terms of trying to get the easy to digest stuff, I do tend to go for the, what the academics would call the not so academic literature on theories to get a better understanding of what they actually mean. And then going back and reading the more academic, the more wordy or the more fancy sort of foodie bits that Siobhan was saying. So looking back at that and then trying to figure out, actually, do, can I match them up? Can I um, transfer my understanding from the more easy to understand one to the more academic one to try and further my learning just that a little bit more? And by doing that, I feel like now I'm looking at more of the solid stuff and I've been able to expand and broaden my sort of horizon on the theories and step away from your usual attachment and systems theory and you know your Ericsson and your Freud and look at the other lesser wider known theories and try and relate them to situations that I faced in my placement so uh, when I did my placement earlier on this year um, it was in a school and I did talk about it in one of the webinars I can't remember off the top of my head which one it was um but in that on my placement I realized that there's so many different theories that are actually relevant to working with teenagers and adolescents in a school setting and as some of them have come about due to the pandemic so like um, the cycle of grief and the systems theory which was there but then I looked at how that impacts in a school setting because as adults, we have different systems around us compared to teenagers and adolescents and trying to get your head around that, um, I feel has sort of helped me to understand that theory a lot more better as well. So um, I know last week we talked about how sometimes newly qualified social workers or social workers um, have been called baby social workers and we're not but sometimes going back to that sort of roots and doing the weaning process, it can help you to enhance your knowledge. And that's why I went back to the weaning of babies and learning of theory. And I think by doing that, it's allowed me to progress professionally and academically as well. Yeah. I love the idea of starting off with the smooth stuff and then you can get to the stuff that's a bit lumpy. And then I really like that idea. But when you talked about weaning, it reminded me of, you know, you all know my kids are grown up now, 30 and 21. Um, but I've got a friend who's got a very young baby and 
And I was saying, oh, when you're starting weaning, it's totally different now. Weaning now is totally different than it was 20 years. And I remember my first daughter weaning in a particular way. Nine years later, the health visitor was saying, oh, no, you don't wean like that now. You wean like this. And now it's totally, it's all baby led weaning and, you know, just give them a lump of carrot or something. I'm like, it's really strange. It's very different to weaning when I was a new parent. So things change and food stuff changes. I found this on the internet to show how just weaning plans change. You know, what we consider to be healthy food has changed. And yet, you know, Kulchimi, you just mentioned the pandemic, and I think we're not revisiting the theory base and looking at how it should be changed in new ways of working. So, you know, a standard old, if you like, staple of communication was Egan's solar model, which is all about how you should sit squarely to the person and open body language, lean towards them, give them good eye contact without staring, have a relaxed posture. And yet, if you're doing that online, does that make any sense? It doesn't, does it? So we need to revisit things and see things differently and look at change. So I love the ideas that the team brought around theory and food. So we're going to come towards the end. But just before we get to the end, I want to say this isn't just about theory, is it? It's also about reflection. So um, Paolo Freire says that critical reflection on practice is a requirement of the relationship between theory and practice. So to link theory and practice, we've got to critically reflect, haven't we? Otherwise, he says, theory simply becomes blah, blah, blah. And practice is just pure activism. So actually, we've got to critically reflect on the relationship between theory and practice and reflection and food still links, same as theory and food links. One of my favourite concepts in reflection is to think about reflexive spaghetti. And it was John Burnham in the early 90s wrote about this. And he said, some people reflect on their reflections and then they reflect on that and reflect. And they end up tying themselves up and preventing action. He calls it reflexive spaghetti. And I just love this image of thinking, is that what sometimes we look like when we're trying to reflect on the theory and the practice that we're using together? We just tie ourselves up and it's like a pot of spaghetti tipped up. Last night, the Great British Bake Off started. I was thinking we should see if they'll sponsor us as a team, sponsor the webinars, the Great British Bake Off. That would be very lovely. But we all love it. We, we really do enjoy the Great British Bake Off. I was working late last night, so I've not watched it. So don't give me any spoilers. But I do love the Great British Bake Off. Tend to catch up at the weekends. But because social workers love the Great British Bake Off, there is a model of reflection based on the Great British Bake Off. I don't know if you've come across it. It's one of my favourites. It's on the Reflective Practice cards, the Great Social Work Bake Off, where it helps us to think through our reflection for action, in action and on action. You've got all of the stages of reflection going on with the questions on there, taking us through our baking or our social work practice. I think it's a really great one. And of course, I love a bit of cake anyway, because I'm dieting, just desperate for some cake. So nobody wants pot noodle social work. Kelly said we might get sued by pot noodle for saying this. But anyway, nobody wants pot noodle social work, do we? Nobody wants that proceduralized practice where you just pour hot water on and say you've cooked. You know, nobody wants that. Even if you go for the more upmarket version, you still don't want it. It's still no good. That's not what we want. So I think as social workers, we need to just stop warming up the ready made meals because like that picture shows, they never turn out like they're supposed to look anyway. If you've just got one of them kind of ready made things that you stick in the microwave. Theory informed practice can produce much more nutritious and diverse food for the profession. We just got to get hold of theory. We just got to stop being scared of theory as social workers and as students. Theory provides more than just food for thought. Theory provides the essential nutrients that enhance, inform and provide validity for the practice that we do as social workers. And theory also reflects the complexity and the diversity of social work practice. So theory, it's more than simply the icing on the cake. It is 
the cake. There is no cake without theory. There is no social work without theory. You've got to have the cake with the icing. And despite the fact that I'm on a diet, don't let anybody tell you that you can't have your cake and eat it because we can use theory in practice. We've just got to stop being scared of it. So if you are brand new and today was your first day in campus, like we've heard some of you say, don't let the fact we've referred to theories that you think I've never heard of them, it's terrified me. Just don't be scared of theory. Just don't be scared of having a go at cooking. You know, just get the ingredients you've got, cook. The more you practice your cooking, the better your cooking becomes. And that's what it's about. The more you get feedback from other people, that tasted nice, that didn't taste nice. The more your cooking gets better in the same way, the more that your social work will improve when you're using theory and practice. Don't be scared of it. Hopefully tonight's been a bit of fun, stopped people being scared of theory. And we'll look in more depth on other occasions at theory, but hopefully tonight's brought a bit of fun. So we love the fact that many of you join us every week. Here's what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. I'm really looking forward to next week. We've got Richard Devine coming, who has been a guest with us before on our recording webinar where he just did a few minutes. But he's going to lead the whole of the webinar next week. And he's looking at um, conflict and relationship based practice. So he's looking at, OK, how do we work in a relationship based way when there's conflict? So we're all really looking forward to hearing from him as a team. He, he was great at the last time he was a guest. Then we're going to look at dissertations, extended essays, basically all the end point assessments that you do at the end of your social work training. And then we've got social work and the menopause. There is something in the next few weeks that you want to be able to come to. So the link for next week is in the chat now. Otherwise, remember, you can always email us and there's the email address on screen now and you always get the automated reply with here's the links for you to join. It's always there in the automated reply. So thank you ever so much for attending tonight. Um, hopefully it all worked okay for you. And good night, everybody. Bye.